Sometimes you move through the city and feel it in your bones. How strange and new this all is. The spectacle of modern civilization just barely older than you are. With its cramped logic, its rules and grid lines. There's a part of you that remembers you are not at home here. That still remembers Eden and longs to return. There's a part of you that longs to leave your car idling in traffic and hop the fence and flee. To live off the land without tools. Experience nature in all its simplicity. And yet another part of you knows that Eden is a fantasy. Our oldest symbols of nature are unnatural. The plants we eat are sterile. The family dog is just another piece of technology designed and bred to serve a purpose. And you too are a domesticated animal, shrouded in synthetic fibers and synthetic thoughts. Even if you wander off to sleep in the woods with a stove and a backpack, Everything from the buzzing in your ears to the howling in the distance will be trying to tell you, you are not at home here. As much as you want to sink your claws in the dirt, you'll always be floating somewhere about it, trailing clouds of civilization where you go.
It was nearly two hours of driving after we had passed the ranger station at the entrance to Yosemite National Park before we got to our destination. On top of several days drifting across the wide expanse of the Wild West they keep telling us is tame now. Down forever long stretches of highway, slowly but continuously altering one's consciousness a few monotonous miles at a time. We are on this road that is just out in some nothing desert for as far as you can see. There's not anything going on. This road stretches all the way. It looks like it just drives straight into that mountain. This road just goes on and on and on. Laid down according to the vision of modern 20th century America. Built to connect and deliver us seamlessly across an unfathomable void. First, through deadly expanses of deserts that had impeded, permanently or otherwise, so many who had tried to make the traverse in the not too distant past. Ruins and artifacts of previous civilizations that had somehow accorded enough harmony in these harsh environs to survive for millennia before we ever got here. Then, eventually, mountains covered in evergreen pines, and beyond them ancient old-growth trees among the last surviving relics of a time never really known to our peoples. Tall, formidable peaks, some still topped with snow even in the dead heat of summer, reaching up almost to the heavens, then plummeting down almost as drastically into a valley dipping far below beyond view. Yet the road, rising some 10,000 feet in elevation in parts, was continuously dotted with conservatively low speed limit signs. An idea that if you just stay on the designated path, take it slow and follow the rules, you'll be fine. Deceptively tamed Americana, contained and conserved under a thin veil, and beyond, unknown. Cars full of tourists stopped off at scenic pullouts and the presence of rangers every few miles instilled a visible sense of safety, routine, familiarity, banality, even hominess amid an otherwise vast wilderness. Don't feed the deer if there's only half a body. They're zombies. They will plague. A park so immense that its boundaries could never be kept by the promise of control its bureaucratic overlay implied. No matter how many rules and signs and ranger stations they slap down on this place and those like it, it's a false promise. The true chaos of nature, its inherent uncertainty, can never be tamed. An environment that doesn't owe us a safe, orderly home. Indeed, you don't have to go very far off the trail to be quickly reminded you are at nature's mercy. And after winding pathways around, up, and down thousands of feet here and there, hovering on the edge of cliff sides, where in truth, it wouldn't be too hard to accidentally make a wrong turn and just disappear, which seems to happen more often than you might think. We found our way down into the depths of the valley and pulled finally into the Awani Hotel parking lot amid copious warnings about hungry, carjacking bears. Even booking this hotel was improbable. Some people apparently wait years to reserve a room, and even five months out, a lot of forethought for us. We realized our luck in happening upon just a single room available for one night only, the last night that was open for the entire summer and months beyond, I think, and by strange coincidence, it just so happened to be the night of the 10th anniversary of our first meeting each other. Filming for three different projects at once, we decided to plan the entire rest of our trip around that date. It was a beautiful place we'd both always hoped to stay in and driven past once or twice on previous visits to the park years before. We'd also both come to know it as the iconic inspiration for one of the main sets used in Stanley Kubrick's film, The Shining. 
We'd been working on our own analysis of the film, and we wanted to know why Kubrick chose this location, all the way out in California, and not the Colorado setting of the story, to be the heart of his movie. The very presence of the place was uncanny. Like walking back in time, or out of time, and on to the shining movie set. Familiar like some place you'd been before, maybe even as many as a dozen times, but everything has been moved ever so slightly out of place, so your mind simply can't rest in it. Why had Kubrick chosen to flip the lobby? Is this where the minds of the film's characters were to reside in isolation for the winter? Was it connected to the ghost stories that some of the staff members would almost nervously pass along to us during our stay? Why did this quaint hotel in the midst of a beautiful wilderness justify the setting of horror? When veteran auteur and master director Stanley Kubrick brought Stephen King's 1977 novel The Shining to life, he did so in near-complete secrecy. The film was billed as the ultimate horror, a phrase that would accompany the first wave of promotions attempting to draw audiences to its summer 1980 release. But ultimately it drew mixed reviews, with some not finding the scary movie or faithful novel adaptation they expected. What makes The Shining the ultimate horror film that has in the years since generated an almost unparalleled cult following? After all, it has no butcher knife wielding escaped mental patients or drowned hockey players slashing up the playground. No blood is even physically spilled in the film until the end, and the majority of the horror takes place with all the lights shining right on it. Perhaps it's because viewers got Kubrick's definition of horror wrong. Perhaps it's because his film confronts us with something much more horrifying. Perhaps it's the ultimate horror because it holds up a mirror to a society that desperately wants to look anywhere else but at its own reflection. Look anywhere than in the twisting past through the endless shadowy back rooms of its own subconscious depths. Because as it turns out, people don't really like to look into mirrors when it wasn't their idea. In The Shining, we watch an average American family unknowingly running on the resultant programming of so many buried childhood, ancestral, and societal traumas that they're complete strangers to themselves as they get isolated together for a few months and completely self-destruct in what otherwise should be a peaceful space of scenic beauty that more than meets all the basic physiological necessities that form the base level of Maslow's Hierarchy of Needs Pyramid complete with so much food they could eat for a year and never have the same meal twice. Oh, one thing for sure, you don't have to worry about food because you folks have eat up here a whole year and never have the same menu twice. So at first watch, people didn't really like this movie. And that's because Kubrick wasn't just making a fiction adaptation to Nibble Popcorn 2 in between cheesy jump scares. Instead, he went out of his way to use Stephen King's novel as a container and the screen as a vehicle to drive audiences to that place where the lines between fantasy and reality are blurred to unrecognizability. Once there, he tapped into the dark and rarely explored depths of the collective American psyche, forcing us all to confront the shadows lurking down there, taking the audience along for the augmented reality horror ride, whether they liked it or not. A lot of conspiratorial theories have been tossed out there about what this movie is attempting to express, and we've pretty much heard them all. Here's part one of another. In the very first moment of Kubrick's opening credits, we're confronted with a mirror. The whole film is made out of them. So many, in fact, that you could play this movie forwards, overlapping with the movie backwards, and scenes seem to call and answer each other front to back. It is well known that Stanley Kubrick is not a director who left anything to chance. The bird's eye view of the camera follows a yellow Volkswagen Beetle to the Continental Divide. This fades into the road to Timberline Lodge, the exterior used for the Overlook Hotel in the film. Interestingly, like the rest of the Hall of Mirrors that make up this movie, when we later see Jack taking his family to the hotel to start his job as caretaker there, 
Their car is driving on the other side of the canyon, in what would technically be the opposite direction. As author and artist Julie Kearns points out, the opening shots along with the closing day shots pinpoint a kind of psychological, philosophical, mystical place for the Lodge as being on the Continental Divide. In the opening, the VW travels east to west on the Going to the Sun Road, and the final crossfade is just to the west of the Continental Divide. In the closing day section, the VW travels west to east on the road, and the final crossfade to the Lodge occurs west of the Continental Divide. There's really only one road to the Overlook, so it would be impossible to approach the lodge from the opposite, westerly direction. From the very first shots of the film, in other words, we, the audience, become Alice through the looking glass. We follow Jack's VW Beetle as it twists and turns through mountains along a road located in Glacier National Park, literally called Going to the Sun Road. The same one we also once drove, not even realizing we'd seen it maybe a dozen times on screen in a movie first. This is not Road to Bob's House or Highway 16 or Mountain Park Road, but Going to the Sun Road. The road itself is held up by a retaining wall they named Golden Stairs. I mean, the whole thing sounds like an alchemist inside joke. Going to the Sun Road is an engineering marvel, physically designed to blend into the mountainside, and it closes in late October and remains closed through spring due to snow. Going to the Sun has been described as, quote, one of the most difficult roads in North America to snowplow in the spring. And reopening it each year is a process the Park Service sums up as a monumental challenge. It's so beleaguered by snow that Going to the Sun Road isn't fully open most years until July. The time astronomers refer to the Earth being at its aphelion, or most distant point in its orbit, from the Sun. So this is a road, then, that could only take you to the sun in the dead of winter when it is impassable and closed to the public. A road open just long enough for hordes of tourists to unconsciously ponder its mystery, just long enough to turn around in October and begin the closing process for winter all over again, Sisyphus struggling in vain to outmaneuver nature year after year. So what do you think Kubrick is trying to say by starting this film on a road to the sun that its height can only take passengers as far away from the sun as possible. The same is true of the fictional Sidewinder Pass described in The Shining. As the seasons would inevitably bring it to a close with the onslaught of foreboding weather, young Danny of the book would observe the feeling of isolation he associated with the road he pictured as a long black snake lying in the sun, an uneasy feeling that crept in knowing that the road was the only way back to civilization, the only way out. The start of the film finds Jack on his way to an interview for a role as the winter caretaker of an off-season hotel, a hotel his son is having a bad feeling about, which his wife ignores through her rose-colored glasses. Or is he? What job is Jack interviewing for exactly? And who exactly is interviewing him? The Shining is about a family that voluntarily stranded itself in an impassable, snowbound stretch of mountains in pursuit of the American dream. Not unlike the Donner Party that Kubrick summons from the depths of our collective psyche during the family's initial drive up the mountainside. We were a party of settlers in covered wagon times. They got snowbound one winter in the mountains. They had to resort to cannibalism in order to stay alive. You mean they ate each other, huh? They had to, in order to survive. To this day, Year after year since it happened in the gold rush of the mid-1800s, generation after generation of American schoolchildren get taught the horrifying cautionary tale of the Donner Party, of ordinary settlers who chased a dream out west and ended up trapped in the snow, desperately resorting to cannibalism in order to survive. The Torrances would put their lives at stake reaching for that dream too, and the father would go mad and resort to eating his own in order to achieve it. But unlike the Donner Party, they would do so in a place with comfortable shelter, heat, and more than enough food to feed everyone. The Shining, then, is about sacrificing the future to feed the unending appetites of the past. The Overlook Hotel portrayed in the film draws from a tapestry of America's nature scenes. Real-world settings composed from America's places of play, parks, forests, lodges 
that are equally a testament to the work of westward pioneers pushing to close the frontier, civilizing in waves the once wild west. Thus, a menagerie of iconic locations relay an unarticulated story, with the film connecting a drive through Glacier National Park to an establishing shot at the Timberline Lodge. This, in turn, delves into the moody atmosphere of the interior of Kubrick's Overlook, largely drawn from the Great Lodge of the Awani Hotel, which is located at the base of a valley sitting at the feet of natural giants like Half Dome and Glacier Point in Yosemite National Park. Featuring the lobby, the red elevators, and the great lounge where character Jack Torrance, played by actor Jack Nicholson, works on his play. Kubrick's Overlook interior also prominently features touches of the old Harvey Hotels, like the El Navajo in Gallup, New Mexico. Last but not least, there's the Biltmore, whose gold room inspired The Shining's infamous gold ballroom. This one's a fancy affair out in the Phoenix, Arizona desert, seemingly conceived more as a temple than a hotel, which famously prides itself on the fact that every American president has stayed there at least once since it was built. A hotel whose art deco goddess decor keeps its patrons forever frozen in the mythical height and economic boom of the Roaring Twenties, artistically concealing a network of hidden rooms, including a speakeasy used by elite guests known as the Mystery Room. Uh, four presidents who stay here. Lots of movie stars. Royalty? All the best people. Blatantly absent from the film is the Stanley Hotel in Estes Park, Colorado, on the edge of Rocky Mountain National Park, the physical location that Kubrick's film is supposedly set in. Stephen King claimed none other than this hotel as the central inspiration for his novel. Also glaringly absent from the establishing shot of the film is the infamous hedge maze, the one that was never in Stephen King's novel to begin with, but is so integral to what happens in Kubrick's film which the director is point-blank informing his audience up front in the first two minutes via a wide overhead shot, exists there somewhere, but is seemingly not physically there at all. In an ironic twist, a miniature version of the maze, again, never part of King's original story, has been erected in recent years out in front of the actual Stanley Hotel in Colorado today. Well, why not have a hedge maze, right? It's over even high. Oh, we went the wrong way. Look. The Awani Hotel is dripping in Native American themes before you even get inside, starting with its logo, which the hotel gift shop clerk informed us was just an old Native American symbol at the bottom of a basket. An artifact from an earlier time just found at the site. Everywhere you look is covered in these patterns and it feels as though if you were to linger in the halls too long, the sheer saturation of these symbols would seep into you and, and shift your consciousness into some kind of altered state.
site is supposed to be located on an Indian burial ground, and I believe they actually had to repel a few Indian attacks as they were building it. This place was built on the past, an Indian burial ground. And the memory of these tribes that had inhabited this place have forever been woven into the background through the decor and quite purposefully by the Awani Hotel's architects. When the current version of the hotel was being built in the 1920s, America's national parks were still quite young. Average Americans were not yet sold on the idea of an annual pilgrimage to these remote places of natural wonder. This site was chosen for its seclusion and singing beauty. And upper class Americans were notoriously underwhelmed by the existing accommodations in national parks. It's been said that Lady Astor refused to stay at the earlier hotel there at Yosemite, and that the upgrades were inspired by her influential upper-class desires for a certain type of first-class comfort. This went hand in glove with the philosophy of American industrialist and millionaire Stephen Mather, who led the campaign to create a federal agency to oversee the national park system, and then became its first director after it was established in 1916. A sign outside of the Grand Lodge, as they call it, notes that Mather, who, quote, was as at home in the High Sierras as he was in high society, end quote, knew that influential people would have to be convinced to care about the park, and thus building the hotel was a means to the end of attracting clientele from this part of high society. The sign also notes, quote, Kings and queens, presidents and prime ministers, movie stars and celebrities have all graced the Awani's guest list. End quote. Royalty? All the best people. In a strange synchronicity, Mr. Mather, a man who could be considered the first caretaker of the national park system, also suffered bouts of mental illness so severe that he had to take a leave of absence more than once. Mr. Mather also just so happens to have been born on the 4th of July. Room 601, one of the four rooms situated on the top floor, is named The Mather. Ironically, this is the room of all possible rooms in the hotel we were given. We didn't ask for it. Yet, despite the appeal to high society, the architects also wanted these new lodges being built at national parks across the country to blend in with their natural environment, to complement the real reasons for their existence, and, less publicly, to put a mark on the territory, one made by the Anglo establishment, thus supplanting the indigenous inhabitants that had been forcibly displaced by the possession of Western territories part of which became National Park lands. Even the rustic blend with nature architectural style had been influenced by a movement started in Great Britain. Now America's most influential designers were running with that to create a style indicative of a time of modern progress, of settling the still mostly unsettled West that had been fought and schemed over, conquered, and added to the map of the United States, inked in blood, but which arguably remain largely uncivilized. Whatever that means. During this larger struggle, the Native American tribe called the Yosemites, who had historically occupied this valley in the Sierras, were removed at gunpoint multiple times in the early 1850s by U.S. militiamen. Because the Miwok tribe, rivals to the Yosemites, cooperated with the military relocation, they were better treated, and today are even better remembered inside the park via a 19th century demonstration village and with artwork and plaques, etc. The word Yosemite is what the Miwok called the original tribe living in the Awani Valley, whom they feared because it literally means those who kill. So Yosemite Park is actually those who kill park. <laughs> Interesting name, huh? And in the long run, Native Americans would have to be forcibly removed from Yosemite by the American government at least four different times, the last being all the way up to 1969. 
Once it became a national park in 1890, a uniquely American vision would be imposed upon Yosemite. Along with other famed parks like Yellowstone and the Grand Canyon, beckoning Americans to visit natural places reserved for recreation with a reverent pilgrimage, a duty to leave their mark while minimizing their traces on the physical environment. The hotel itself is situated like a pyramid, though it's much more obvious at night. A more recent Miwok portrait over a second floor fireplace is very curious in this regard. Floors two through five are eerily similar in their dark, rustic design. The same wooden bench with native wall hanging across from the same intricately painted elevator with the same historical placard framed to the left of it on every floor. These floors are so similar, in fact, that if you weren't paying attention and accidentally got off the elevator on the wrong one, you might not even notice. The only real difference is that each floor gets a little bit smaller as you go up. Then, in an almost jarring, uncanny fashion, the sixth floor at the top of the pyramid yields a totally different style and feel, a different look in the penthouse. This is a different message. The wallpaper is a light blue with floral designs that seem to stare back at you the longer you looked at it. And there is more information here about the ruling couple of the Awani and their prominent participation in the special medieval English Christmas feast that takes place there every winter. But we'll get to that in due time. Quote, the character of the Tresseter penthouse was quite different from the hotel's public spaces and reflected the English country with a capital C, style that they preferred. Today, though no longer a private residence, the sixth floor retains the eclectic nature and elegant simplicity of the European traditions that inspired its design, end quote. The entire floor had once been the permanent, year-round residence of Mary Curry Tresseter and her husband David, both of whom had been instrumental in building up the modern facade of this park. She would ultimately die on the sixth floor in 1970, and an employee who approached me while I was filming told me that he believed she still haunted the halls there. Interesting to note that the hotel used a combination with her and the year of her death as the Wi-Fi password during our stay. Odd coincidence that despite reserving what was literally the last room in the entire place months earlier and not getting to choose what type of room that would be, we end up assigned to this floor. Again, we didn't request it. Throughout the rest of the hotel, every room's doorway and at the end of every maze-like hallway, a disorienting yet fascinating piece of Native American artwork borrowed by the modern residents and continuously blended into the background to the point that one might stop noticing it consciously. Something wholly inspired by a past that didn't seem to just linger, but felt frozen in these eerie and strange hallways. The uncanny undoubtedly belongs to all that is terrible, to all that arouses dread and creeping horror. Sigmund Freud. Drowning, are you scared of this place? No, scared of nothing here. It is known that in preparation for his adaptation of The Shining, Kubrick and his writing partner Diane Johnson studied Sigmund Freud's famous 1919 paper on the uncanny a famous piece that probably informed the basic dynamics of all Hollywood films from there on out, especially those based around horror and suspense. 
Is there something bad here? Well, you know, Doc, when something happens, it can leave a trace of itself behind. Not things that anyone can notice, but things that people who shine can see. King himself mentioned Freud numerous times in The Shining. It formed part of his basic explanation of the brain science behind Danny's major ability the story is named for. Was it a gift or a curse? Now hold your eyes still so I can see. Either way, it delved into the great mystery separating the known mechanical processes of the brain and the deeper subconscious workings of the mind, which only occasionally fed symbols back across the threshold to inform the conscious person about a much more vast, greater unconscious, unknown quantum of reality, terra incognita. The concept of the uncanny is a contradiction in terms. It's at once familiar, and as we all know, the familiar should provide the comfort of something well-known and well-understood. And yet, it's not familiar. Something uncanny is something creepy, but in a strangely familiar way that sets a person ill at ease. Everything might look superficially right, but it feels wrong. Thus, being in an uncanny environment one that cannot ever be reconciled, at the very least would cause continual low-level anxiety. It'd be like walking on an almost imperceptibly tilted floor, forever throwing you just off balance. Therefore, equilibrium, which all things seek, can never be reached in an uncanny space. This is because, as psychoanalytic theorist Jacques Lacan wrote, The uncanny puts us in the field where we do not know how to distinguish bad and good, pleasure from displeasure. The concept of the uncanny is related to the term unheimlich. Heimlich is a German word that means hidden or secret, and the base word heim means home. So it has two very different meanings from one another. On one hand, heimlich is familiar and comfortable, and yet at the same time, concealed from view. I think a lot of things happened right here in this particular hotel over the years. And not all of them was good. The opposite would be unheimlich, which German philosopher Friedrich Schelling defined as the name for everything that ought to have remained hidden and secret and has become visible. The forbidden coming to light destroys the contradictory peace of mind its secrecy provided. In other words, as long as the monsters stay down there in the dark, quietly creeping around in the shadowy basement, out of sight, out of mind, well, then everything feels safe and squishy, comfortable. Coming face to face with these things that should have remained hidden can definitely produce a sense of the uncanny and all the anxiety and fear that comes with it. Likewise, most of the terror of what happens in The Shining happens with all the lights on. Wouldn't it be dramatic, supposing the people inside were dead, all stretched out with the lights quietly burning about them? Sometimes too many lights on, right in full view. You're scared of 237, ain't you? No During the tour of the hotel grounds, as they're walking past the hedge maze, There are an abundance of trash cans with American flag signs on them that say, Keep America Clean. At least four crammed together in this short walk. Way more than necessary. Kind of ironic they're in the same scene where the Torrances are informed that the hotel sits on an Indian burial ground. The site is supposed to be located on an Indian burial ground, and I believe they actually had to repel a few Indian attacks as they were building it. Nothing 
So, in a movie that is patently unheimlich in every way, eerily familiar in its emptiness and off-kilter edginess. The players are very much working at the age-old game, drawn from life and illustrated in literature and media by Freud. While ostensibly welcoming and awe-inspiring, the Awani Hotel in Yosemite and other great lodges across American landscapes also represent a deep repression of a wellspring of feelings about Native American tribes wiped out, land taken and occupied, colonization, and a history built upon genocide. And that's just scratching the surface. A bloody stain. Keep this area clean. A memory unwashed, at least altogether. One of those things that leaves a trace of itself behind. Again and again, Kubrick is warning us not to get too comfortable, as he lets us know we're not really at home here. Over the fireplace of the great lounge where Jack works on his play throughout the film is a very prominent mural, almost a character in of itself silently watching over everything that happens in that room. And like the great hotels of America's parks, it too has a story. How do you like it? <laughs> the picture depicts several figures standing next to blue stalks of corn, the most important crop in many Native American tribes, with blue corn holding special significance to several tribes in the American Southwest, particularly the Hopi. The figures belong to the art tradition of the Navajo, close neighbors to the Hopi, who are mutually linked to the mystic teachings of ancient Puebloan cultures that have inhabited the Four Corners area continuously for a millennia or more. Their symbols are closely tied to the mystery of the landscape and the wisdom developed over generations for both physical survival and spiritual enlightenment. The mural depicts the Ye, supernatural beings who inhabit the tops of sacred mountains in the Navajo religion separated by a veil from the life of mortals, but who influence their lives. The blue and red rainbow border is a rainbow guardian, a special type of yay that demarcates the separation between the supernatural and the natural, between the physical material plane and the spiritual one. But such murals were traditionally done in sand, each color specifically collected from far off locations with special ingredients by a tribal medicine man in order to heal individuals from particular ailments or to instruct initiates into the secretive symbolic teachings of their tribal religion. These murals were constructed in timing with the rising and setting sun and destroyed at the end of the same day when the ceremony was completed. They were never meant to be permanent nor seen by outsiders. The 1975 book, The Mind's Eye, shows a curious portrait of such a yay painting, complete with the medicine man known as the Great Teacher, holding a ceremonial rattle next to a sacred fire in front of sacred mountains, sharing the knowledge of its meaning and spiritual power with a young boy who is his initiate. How sharply does this contrast with Jack? Jack, who, in an attempt to overcome writer's block, and harness his creativity in one scene throws a tennis ball mindlessly back and forth along the mural's edges on the wall, never getting past the rainbow barrier. Jack, who believes he is qualified to create, to write, and to teach the quote, great mystery, creative writing. Jack, who believes he is teaching something of value and significance to his boy Danny, but also Jack, who writes his play Curiously enough, on the left side of the fire, like the great teacher on the mural, and whose son Danny is only ever seen on the right side of the fire once after he's been apparently abused. There Jack sits, scene after scene, in the space of someone parlaying real wisdom. Other versions of Ye paintings were woven into sacred tapestries and blankets, but none of these, at least initially, were ever meant for public display. 
As the Western frontier closed, tribal life faced both an existential threat from genocide and conquest, and simultaneously one from appropriation by European-derived Americans who wanted this art and who became very persuasive in getting impoverished Native Americans to sell their sacred art for commercial purposes and for display. For better or for worse, the mythology and occult symbolism at the heart of the Navajo religion became at least partially known to the American public in the 19th century. And as this art was made public, Native American artists began to alter details, began to alter these murals in slight ways and to invert aspects of them so as to veil the sacred teachings contained within them and thereby not to violate the religious aspects and anger the community elders or ultimately the spirits themselves. Quote, A sand painting, when done for ceremonial purposes, follows a completely different sequence than the same sand painting when done for a public showing. The former is sacred and is executed with reverence, and the later, occasionally done for exhibition purposes, Color and direction both are reversed, and many variations brought into effect. In this way, the sacred altar of the sand painting is not desecrated or the symbols violated by a curious and non-understanding audience. So, to repeat, Kubrick has Jack's character working at the foot of an altar where the fire may be lit, but the sacred symbols have been purposefully reversed and rendered ineffective. Featuring this mural so prominently here is one of the most literal visual interpretations of the unheimlich. It is the epitome of Schelling's definition as used in Freud's paper on the uncanny, something that should have remained secret, but which has nevertheless become visible. And so this mural in particular recalls a very specific hotel with a strangely relevant backstory. The El Navajo was constructed in Gallup, New Mexico and fully opened in 1923 as part of a new chain of Western luxury hotels that would accompany restaurants launched by Fred Harvey that would in turn follow the Atchison, Topeka, and Santa Fe Railroad. The story goes that Fred Harvey, a British immigrant who came to America in 1850, met with railroad officials in the centennial year of 1876 with an idea. He left with a handshake deal with the railroad's president to open a chain of restaurants every 100 miles along the tracks to provide meals to travelers when the train stopped to refuel. These became known as Harvey Houses, the first official restaurant chain in the United States, which held a pivotal place in the evolution of the country. In all lands and in all times, men have been prospectors seeking the treasures of the earth, yellow gold. The extremities of the Donner Party exhibited a fallout of the larger campaign to draw settlers westward in order to colonize California under the promise of gold. Below, almost hidden in the snow, lies the crack express train city of San Francisco, which stalled at Donner Pass, some 7,000 feet up in the high Sierras. Nurses and other rescue workers board a relief train to go to the aid of the 222 passengers and crew members marooned on the snowbound streamliner. These scenes give an idea of the depth of the snow. But the lack of food, resources, and facilities to resupply along the way left many, such as the Donners, at the cruel mercy of the elements. Donner Pass got its name, by the way, from a party of pioneers who were stopped here a hundred years ago by blizzards. There were no diesel trains to come to their rescue, and many perished from cold and starvation. And so, a few decades later, with these gruesome mistakes of the Donner Party tucked safely away in the nation's past, the cornerstone of Fred Harvey's enterprise would be to make sure that this time there was enough food and accommodations for everyone. But these Harvey houses were no McDonald's of the Wild West, and they certainly weren't serving the unhygienic slop that westward travelers had apparently grown accustomed to. These restaurants were considered fine dining, complete with trained chefs, fresh food brought in daily served on white table linens, and a menu of massive portions by comparisons to restaurants back east. 
A piece of pie served at a Harvey house, for example, was a full one-fourth of the pie, as compared with the average pie cut into six or eight pieces anywhere else. This must be where pies go when they die. Harvey houses took their oversized portions very seriously. House managers made daily food reports to ensure that meals were standardized across all Harvey locations and no one would leave hungry. No Donner party would ever happen out west ever again, at least not on their watch. I believe they tried to keep this Harvey hotel rolling for a while, even after the chain was done. Today, though, it sits in ruins. You can see the distinctive southwestern style. They said, give or take, he had these every hundred miles. And it brought the civilization westward with food and hospitality. From its conception until World War II, when many of the restaurants closed, these Harvey houses imported some 100,000 young girls from the other half of the country inducing them to move out west and become waitresses known as Harvey Girls, cheerful, conservatively dressed women aged 18 to 30 who became the face of this movement to bring hospitality and homegrown American values to the hardly civilized outpost of the still Wild West. Harvey Girls were held to a strict standard of demeanor, wore little or no makeup, and were to exhibit proper manners and conduct befitting of a lady at all times. So infamous were the Harvey girls over the decades that Judy Garland would star in a 1946 movie about their taming of the Wild West in a cringy musical format with an over eight minute long song about the railroad. This part. <laughs> that won an Oscar. It's a treat to be on your feet all day. but which otherwise suffered a threadbare plot, all to carry a pretty specific message. A Harvey girl is more than a waitress. Wherever a Harvey house appears, civilization is not far behind. You girls are the symbol and the promise of the order that is to come. In a mirror of societal attitudes of the time, crude Hollywood tropes also cast Native Americans in the background of many of the film's scenes like props always looking depressed and downtrodden, despite how excited everyone else seemed to be about the railroad. The Fred Harvey Company also opened up a so-called Indian department which oversaw a sightseeing side quest known as Indian Detours that would take what advertisements referred to as the most discerning travelers off the beaten path of the railroad and onto the, quote, roads to yesterday, going back through the centuries to visit native pueblos and archaeological sites. This network created the foundation of southwestern tourism in the United States, drawing even more Americans out west, this time for vacation. In turn, Harvey's Indian Department brought the first American dollars to indigenous tribes in the area who became official Harvey Company employees, selling their wares to tourists on the detours and in hotel gift shops. Prior to this, many indigenous people who inhabited these areas were still on the system of bartering for essentials like groceries, clothing, and guns. The arrangement with the Harvey Company brought them into the American fold, paying them in American dollars and further Americanizing them. With taglines like 3,000 miles of hospitality, the Harvey houses would become famous for their upscale offerings that brought considerable comforts to a harsh environment that civilization as we know it nevertheless insisted on supplanting from its traditional inhabitants. In point of fact, despite the railroad carrying Harvey's food, supplies, and workers to the restaurants for free, many of these Harvey houses were losing money, operating in the red for years before any profits were made. 
civilizing the so-called Wild West seems to be what the entire enterprise was actually ultimately about. Profits second. Thus, the civilization would be brought to the Wild West, and the frontier could and would be settled and closed at last. Harvey partnered with Mary Coulter, who also designed several national park lodges, to create some of his most distinguished hotels, and her designs would incorporate themes and emblems from Native American artwork, most notably from Navajo and Hopi motifs. And the last hotel Coulter designed for Harvey was the El Navajo in Gallup, New Mexico. A stop on I-40 and a gateway to the Navajo, Hopi, Pueblo, and Zuni reservations. Controversially, Coulter had the hotel's main lobby and lounge decorated with sand paintings purchased from Navajo artists, depicting sacred yay spirits including a mural over the main lounge fireplace, more or less like the one depicted in Kubrick's film. Shortly after it was completed, however, there were rumors that the property was cursed, and behind that, anger from Navajo elders who were upset at the appropriation and display of their sacred religious iconography for use as permanent hotel decorations. According to a biography of Mary Coulter, the paintings had never before been employed as decoration for a building, let alone a public one such as this. The sand painting hanging over the central fireplace was considered perhaps the most sacred of all on display in the hotel. It was called Nyanas Ghani, the man who killed fear, which the spokesman review described as, quote, of peculiar sacredness to the Navajo and has been made but rarely. Navajo leaders made it known how upset they were at all this, and tribal singers, those who presided over the sand painting rituals, brought Mary Coulter to trial over it within the tribe, the details of which are unclear. Harvey Company responded by removing the paintings from the hotel and negotiating with the tribe. And eventually, Navajo agreed to conduct a ritual one newspaper described as, quote, a ceremony to take away the curse of the white man using his sacred paintings, which was then followed by a special ceremony known as the Blessing of the House, held on May 25, 1923. This ceremony, led by a 100-year-old Navajo medicine man, involved singing chants and sprinkling the paintings and the grounds of the hotel with sacred corn pollen. Newspapers reported that, quote, the Holy Ones foretold that when all the Navajo sand paintings are forgotten, it is believed that the world would end. The blessing of the El Navajo Hotel and its permanent sand paintings was heavily publicized, and spun as, quote, preserving the paintings for posterity, which is ironic considering it would be only 34 years later that the hotel would be bulldozed to the ground, supposedly to make room for the expansion of Route 66. This side of it looks trashed. It's not the best condition. It's yet another, like, faded hotel. I mean, it's, it just fits generally into the Grand Budapest model, even though it was never as great as the Grand Budapest once it was.
The whole saga speaks to an indifference of modern society, a homogenous broadcast indulgent in pop culture and standardized references in contrast to the slow-cooked, handcrafted, traditional knowledge that is sacred in part because it was handed down intact across countless generations. It was a display of native wisdom that was generally disregarded and overlooked by that which sought to replace it, pretending at greater wisdom that has never matched the technology so often carelessly wielded by modern, quote, advanced peoples. Everything in nature was here long ago. All the coal, the iron, the forest, the oil, the water, the land. Why didn't the Indians do more with it? The Indians had to have food, shelter, comforts. Didn't they raise better food, build better homes? Why didn't the Indians do more with all this? They had some tools. They knew how to make fire. They used fire to clear land. When the growth was burnt off, the Indian women planted corn like this with a clam shell and a hoe made from the shoulder blade of a deer. Yes. They had tools, Stone Age tools, but they never improved their tools. And as a result, they couldn't improve their production of food, shelter, and comforts. Compare this with the pioneer farmers. Unlike the Awani it is based on, Kubrick's fireplace was moved to the center of the lounge, seemingly almost to necessitate the display of this massive sand painting. Why did he draw in this element? There's no way such an exacting director placed such an imposing mural front and center by accident. The past is hard to rectify here in the good old U.S. of A. And deep down, most of us Americans know it. A country whose colorful yesterdays can be recreated through the magic of motion pictures. I mean, if I went to my neighbor's house one day, planted my flag down in the middle of his front yard and just declared it was mine now, that would be called theft. In the present day 21st century, we all know this. It wouldn't matter if my justification for it was that my neighbor had a different religion from me, or spoke a language I didn't understand, or he had what I perceived as backwards or savage ways. But somehow, we've been taught over the generations to overlook many of the things that were done in the colonization of this country. We're taught to hold two competing thoughts about this bloody history in our heads at any given time. The exact definition of cognitive dissonance. Well, a forest ranger has found his treasure here. It's his job of protecting and managing this forest so that it will always give so much to so many. On the tour of the hotel they'll be living in for the winter, the general manager who hired Jack, Stuart Ullman, informs them that the hotel was built on an Indian burial ground. The site is supposed to be located on an Indian burial ground, and I believe they actually had to repel a few Indian attacks as they were building it. That's our snowcat. Notice Ullman says it's supposed to be built on an Indian burial ground. I'm not supposed to. Not supposedly. Supposed to be. seems a purposeful difference in language choice there. Then Ullman just moves right along like it's any little factoid not even worthy of a second thought. That's our snowcat. Can you both drive a car? Yes. yes. And neither Jack nor Wendy respond to it. Just like the majority of all Americans have been trained not to. They see the art, maybe. The native motifs, maybe. But they don't really see the Indian. In this and other moments throughout the film, again and again, Kubrick is showing us all how we've accepted and normalized something like genocide, which is absolutely not normal, and should give any of us a pause for at least a follow-up question. If, if 
conviction in a 1968 shooting. And the search continues in the Mount Superior Duration Day for that missing Aspen woman. 24-year-old Susan Robertson has been missing 10 days. She disappeared while on a hunting trip with her husband. Killed his family with an axe. Stacked them neatly in one of the rooms of the West Wing, and uh, then he, uh, he put uh, both barrels of a shotgun in his mouth. But in this environment, there are things we're absolutely not supposed to talk about. The loser has to keep America clean. All right, you're good. You have to keep America clean. I'm going to keep America clean. This history we've been trained not to discuss, we've been trained to overlook, is painful. But ignoring it doesn't change it. It doesn't make it go away. So, so the blood continues to ooze out of the past as if fresh. As head chef Dick Holleran gives Wendy a tour of the Overlook kitchen, something like an industrial factory that's been slapped down in the middle of a setting that's otherwise been designed to blend into its natural surroundings, right after they pass a sign that says, keep this area clean, in the background you can clearly see what looks like a red stain oozing down the wall, right there in the beginning of the movie. Like the blood of generations is just seeping through the cracks. The longer those issues remain ignored like dead elephants in the room, the longer those wounds continue to fester and rot. Yeah, this whole place is such an enormous maze. I feel like I'll have to leave a trail of breadcrumbs every time I come in. (laughs) It requires two different halves of the same mind to play on a playground drenched in the blood of generations past without acknowledgement. It's a hidden picture game of overlooking something really messed up that's simply been allowed to blend into the background over time. Just like the National Park architecture was designed to, and just like the game Stephen King writes about in The Shining, aptly titled, Do You See the Indian? A place for everything and everything in its place, Mommy said. Then you know where it is when you want it. But now things had been misplaced. Things were missing. Worse still, things had been added, things you couldn't quite see. Like in one of those pictures that said, can you see the Indians? And if you strained and squinted, you could see some of them. The thing that you had taken for a cactus at first glance was really a brave with a knife clamped in his teeth. And there were others hiding in the rocks. But you could never see all of them. And that was what made you uneasy. Because it was the ones you couldn't see that would sneak up behind you a tomahawk in one hand and a scalping knife in the other. Danny can see what has happened here. Why don't you want to talk about it? I'm not supposed to. But he's also been taught that there are some things you can't openly discuss and are supposed to pretend you don't know about, pretend never happened, pretend you can't see. Indians? (laughs) You're crazy. There's no Indians around here. They say there are a lot of wild Indians around here. This opens up the wild action world of Fort Apache. With Indians, cavalrymen, shell-shooting cannons. Never seen such a war. Johnny Reb don't get you the engines well. It's a stampede. They're in trouble. Rush Captain Maddox to the rescue, along with General Custer. Who started it? Ferocious Chief Geronimo on his horse Comanche. So that evening, Robin, Matt, and I watched the very last redskin bite the very last bit of dust. Have a pizza roll, Kimo Sabi. Perhaps it was decades of exaggerated propaganda in books, pulp magazines, and movies still locked in the vestiges of the pioneer past which characterized indigenous people as bloodthirsty savages instead of natives defending their homeland that made it hard for the rest of America to fully see the reality of what had been done here. This book is titled A School History of the United States by John Bach McMaster, professor of American history in the University of Pennsylvania, published by American Book Company, Copyright 
1897. Chapter 7 in this book is titled The Indians, and I just want to read you a paragraph on page 69 under the section Traits of Character. Courage and fortitude he possessed in the highest degree. Yet with his bravery were associated all the vices, all the dark and crooked ways, which are the resort of the cowardly and the weak. He was treacherous, revengeful, and cruel beyond description. Much as he loved war, and war was his chief occupation, the fair and open fight had no charm for him. To his mind, it was madness to take the scalp of an enemy at the risk of his own when he might waylay him in an ambush or shoot him with an arrow from behind a tree. He was never so happy as when, at the dead of night, he roused his sleeping victims with an unearthly yell and massacred them by the light of their burning home. Just want to remind you once again, this is a school history of the United States written by an American history professor at the University of Pennsylvania. And it was obviously in use in schools for at least a decade because as you can see, my copy was signed by the student that used it in 1907. So that is what they were teaching school children about Native Americans at the turn of the 20th century. But Kubrick would challenge his viewers to look deeply in the mirror, to the literal edge of the frame, to find the deeper context lurking out of the corner of our eyes. Compartmentalization and willful ignorance come easy when discussing the past. Quinn Smith, Jr. The sarcastic claim has been made that almost every horror film in the late 1970s and 80s featured a plot involving a haunted Indian burial ground. There were quite a few. Kubrick's entire film, The Shining, is on just such a burial ground. As in, all of the main locations he has cobbled together for the setting of the Overlook are places where indigenous people were forcibly removed and supplanted. Has Tony ever told you anything about this place? About the Overlook Hotel? History is never a one-sided story. Most Americans, especially those born in the 20th century, weren't taught much indigenous history in school at all. And most of what has been taught is set only in the context of pioneers or settlers, which, if it doesn't cast natives as villains, cast them as obstacles to settlement. So many Americans literally don't see the Indian. Out of mind, out of sight. The opening drive of the film begins in Glacier National Park, home to the Blackfeet for some 10,000 years before Europeans ever showed up. Glacier was their most sacred space, which they called the backbone of the world. In January 1870, a camp of Blackfeet belonging to Chief Heavy Runner, suffering smallpox, were sleeping soundly one night. The men had gone out to hunt, and the majority of the camp were women, children, and elderly men. Chief Heavy Runner's tribe had been deemed friendly to the U.S. government and were promised protection, even issued a safe conduct document from the U.S. Indian Bureau. Major Eugene M. Baker of the U.S. 2nd Cavalry, on the orders of General Sheridan, set out to suppress a specific band of Blackfeet under Mountain Chief, but came upon this friendly band sleeping instead. Warned by his own scout Joe Kipp that this was the wrong band of people, Major Baker is quoted as having said, That makes no difference. One band or another of them, they are all Blackfeet, and we will attack them. He then ordered one of his sergeants to hold the scout at gunpoint and shoot him if he attempted to warn the sleeping tribe. Kip shouted anyway, rousing Chief Heavy Runner, who ran towards the soldiers waving his paper from the Indian Bureau promising safety. The chief was immediately shot and killed. Once the first shot was fired, soldiers began firing into the lodges of sleeping people, then charged the camp. 
They sliced open lodge coverings with butcher knives and shot the unarmed sleeping inhabitants inside. Others were murdered with axes, and still others who were wounded but had not died from the initial attack were burned to death when they set the entire camp on fire. Figures are disputed, but some 217 lives were barbarically ended that night, including 15 men, 90 women, and 50 children. Despite public outrage once word got out, an official investigation was suppressed. Major Baker, by the way, was accused of being drunk on the morning of the massacre. In a separate incident a couple of years later, the Major was actually arrested by his superior officer for drunkenness and downgraded in his military role. By 1869, the Union Pacific Railroad had divided the buffalo into northern and southern herds. Do you know what happened to the American buffalo? It's considered one of the most infamous conservation horror stories in American history, period. On the South Platte, hunters built fires to keep the buffalo from water at night and killed them as they came to slake their thirst by day. 1875 saw the end. In 1875, the great southern herd was gone. By 1882, the Northern Pacific Railroad was built, and 5,000 hunters and skinners were emptying the northern range. Some 40 million buffalo were purposefully slaughtered by the U.S. Army and other hired hunters because... Colonel Dodge had said, Every buffalo dead is an Indian gone. And buffalo extermination was the unwritten policy in the winning of the West. Many indigenous people starved after their main food source was eradicated, including the Blackfeet, who suffered starvation winters. The worst claimed some 700 lives in the winter of 1883-84. to By contrast, 42 people perished in the Donner Party, and that story is still taught in history class in middle schools around the country to this day. By 1895, starving and desperate to save their children, the Blackfeet offered to sell lands they didn't even personally believe any man could own to the U.S. government, lands that would eventually become Glacier National Park. When Chief Whitecalf bitterly accepted the agreement, he was quoted as saying, Chief Mountain is my head. Now my head is cut off. The mountains have been my last refuge. The sale included an agreement that the Blackfeet could hunt, fish, gather, and carry out their traditional rituals on the lands. But these subsistence rights were extinguished after the lands were officially designated as a national park, and the agreement was, air quotes, reinterpreted by the government. Removed from their most sacred spot, the Blackfeet were given a reservation on the border of the park. In the years that followed, the Great Northern Railway, whose Western Star locomotives were also proudly referred to as Empire Builders, recalling the Atchison, Topeka, and Santa Fe Star of Empire, ran a rail line directly through the Blackfeet Reservation. The railway erected luxury lodges throughout Glacier, including the massive Mini Glacier Hotel, a place that would only be open from June to September each year, then closed for the winter for even longer than the Overlook did in The Shining. The railroad then billed the Montana Park as America's Alps or America's Switzerland, further psychologically blunting the edges of the Wild West to offer travelers European-style architecture and civilization. There's a modern hotel and everything looks very comfortable and is very comfortable. Chalets and waitresses wearing dirndls, who served guests dessert while the orchestra played a waltz or a foxtrot. The waitresses at Glacier Park Hotel dressed in Swedish costumes. The hotel was once again mostly furnished in a rustic wilderness style, with copious bearskins draped over everything and buffalo skulls hanging up everywhere. Although also overlaid with Japanese lanterns for some reason. These lodges provided luxuries at the edge of nowhere, such as a barber shop, tailor shop, hospital, hot and cold running water, and telephones. In the 1970 Glacier National Park Historic Resource Study, James Shear wrote, 
The great northern hotels were not simply rows of rooms where the tired traveler spent the night and hurried on the next morning. They were theaters, stages adorned with the props of wilderness, where the guest and participant could assume a role in the frontier past of Jim Bridger, General Custer, Sitting Bull, and Lewis and Clark. They had atmosphere. Sounds a lot like Westworld. This created atmosphere included the Blackfeet Indians, who were offered menial wages to set up teepees near park lodges and greet train passengers as publicity stunts for a massive advertising campaign. There's an Indian encampment nearby. We're on the edge of the great Blackfeet Reservation. And it's like turning back the pages of history to watch them sing and dance. The Blackfeet were once the terror of the North, but the tide of civilization has swept over them. Another synthetic prop in the supposedly natural setting. Blackfeet tribal members, who had basically been turned into mascots for their own dispossession, were generally barred from entering these hotels which is painfully ironic considering one of the most notable decorations in Mini Glacier, for example, was a huge 180-foot canvas mural painted by Blackfeet chiefs illustrating the tribe's history. Blackfeet, which came to be referred to as the Glacier Park Tribe for a while, were also extensively used on flyers and promotional materials for the park, the railroad, and its hotels. After spending the day singing and dancing for tourists, White employees would bring out kitchen scraps to feed the hungry native performers each night. Blackfeet elder and artist Daryl Norman described the spectacle as, in some ways very humiliating, just to satisfy the curiosity of the traveler. It is not easy to realize the challenge that moving westward meant to these people. Even though they knew the danger, it was a complete uprooting of their lives. Similar stories of using treaties that were ultimately broken to remove indigenous people can be found all across the nation, including in Oregon, the state where the pyramidal-shaped Timberline Lodge sits under Illumination Rock at the foot of Mount Hood, Oregon's highest point settled within the Mount Hood National Forest. The mountain is named for Samuel Hood, 1st Viscount Hood, a British admiral at the Battle of the Chesapeake, and sits partly inside the reservation of the Confederated Tribes of Warm Springs. These tribes signed a treaty back in 1855 that ceded 10 million acres of land to the government in exchange for a peace for their reservation and the rights to fish, hunt, gather berries and roots, and pasture livestock on the ceded lands. Just a decade later, a superintendent with Indian Affairs met with the tribes on the pretense that they were signing an agreement that tribal members would need to carry a written pass when leaving their reservation to use the ceded lands. What the Senate went on to ratify, however, was a supplemental treaty that claimed the tribe abused their use rights and therefore relinquished them to the government. When the tribes learned this was a supplemental treaty, They insisted the document they were presented with said nothing at all about relinquishing their rights. Despite never being officially enforced, the dispute over this deception and the use of this so-called supplemental treaty against these tribes apparently continues to this day. But again and again, the pioneers had to be on a sharp lookout for attack. Their struggle for survival against the Indians was never ending. They were a relentless enemy who resented the coming of the white settlers. They fought tooth and nail for every foot of ground, exacting a terrible toll. Just as hard as the Indians fought, so did the pioneers who needed the land for their families and for freedom. The peak of Mount Hood and its upper slopes are located in a protected area inside the Mount Hood National Forest that was actually dedicated the Mount Hood Wilderness Area in 1964. The supposed pristine Eden of these national parks was further codified for the, quote, permanent good of the whole people in the Wilderness Act of 1964, which placed a legally binding protective overlay on 9 million acres of national parks, forests, and other government lands. 
The act portrays these lands as though they were always an unpeopled landscape. The most telling language defining wilderness as, hereby recognized as an area where the earth and its community of life are untrammeled by man, where man himself is a visitor who does not remain. And further, an area of undeveloped land retaining its primeval character and influence without permanent improvements or human habitation. Not only does this act completely separate humans from nature, but gives the impression of a pure, natural landscape devoid of humans in complete contradiction to thousands of years of known history. As Isaac Cantor wrote in Public Land and Resources Law Review, national parks do not preserve what the West was, they preserve a West which never was. The entire national park system has been presented to Americans as a patriotic conservation project for a virgin wilderness, a showcase of nature in its primeval, untouched state. But this is a complete illusion. Cantor continues, These landscapes were inhabited, their features named, their forests utilized, their plants harvested, and animals hunted. Native Americans have a history in our national parks measured in millennia. They were forcibly removed, and later treaty rights to traditional use, such as hunting and fishing, were erased, often without acknowledgement or compensation. Immediately after these removals, the parks were advertised as a showcase of uninhabited America, nature's handiwork unspoiled. Keep America clean, am I right? It's uncanny to be in a place once inhabited by people for thousands of years, only for them to be purged, and then for everyone else to pretend like they were never there in the first place. Uncanny how you can't shake the feeling of being watched the whole time you're playing on the playground. While the pioneers fought for their lives and their hard-won land, speculators living in splendor in the eastern cities had their eyes on these rich new areas and by political and financial power were able to seize or acquire legal rights to land they had never seen. They could destroy the hard work of the pioneer who had no recourse but to accept the decree of their own government. And today the U.S. government owns the majority of Oregon. In fact, the government owns 47% of all land in the West. The civilizing of the Wild West can be typified in this iconic 1872 painting by John Gast, titled American Progress. It depicts the goddess Columbia, adorned with the star of empire on her forehead, carrying the line of the telegraph and leading settlers westward by trains and in covered wagons, driving the Indians and buffalo out of the picture. As Manifest Destiny, a concept embodying the 19th century American drive to remake the Wild West in the image of the American East, takes hold. Back in 1963, historian Frederick Merck wrote that Manifest Destiny was born out of a sense of mission to redeem the old world by high example, generated by the potentialities of a new earth for building a new heaven. How many people ever notice the goddess is carrying a school book under her right arm? Quite a fancy way of dressing up imperialism. An imperialism that never stopped once America's borders were officially mapped. And yet, even still, the early beginnings of this now centuries-old history hardly ever get seen for what it really was. What it really is. As a narrow slice of a very one-sided history continues to get plastered over the truth. As historian and author Roxanne Dunbar-Ortiz puts it, The myth persists not for a lack of free speech or poverty of information, but rather for an absence of motivation to ask questions that challenge the core of the scripted narrative of the origin story. How might acknowledging the reality of U.S. history work to transform society? With heartbreak, but yet with stout hearts, the American pioneer overcame even the barriers erected by men and won and settled new lands and made new homes westward. There are all kinds of these removals. They could all all be termed as trails of tears. I think the trail of tears, I don't, I mean, I I know it's an enigmatic sort of statement and and title. I don't like it. It kind of avoids 
the harshness of that situation, doesn't it? It makes it kind of seem like poetry. <laughs> it's not poetry. It's you are literally removing these people from their lands forever and taking away all they know and, 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 t and literally impoverishing them, placing them on a reservation where they have nothing and they are completely under the control of the U.S. government. This is the heritage which is America, a heritage drawn from many people, all of whom had one purpose, to build for themselves and their children a land of freedom from oppression and prejudice. Well, sometimes I can see things that happened a long time ago. I think a lot of things happened right here in this particular hotel over the years. And not all of them was good. Broken treaties, buried history calling out silently just under the surface. And like Stephen King wrote, and Kubrick flaunts in our faces on screen in The Shining. The Indian is everywhere in these parks, and hardly anyone sees or acknowledges them. Perhaps that's why Kubrick chose to put up so many Calumet cans on the Overlook's pantry shelf. Calumet is a noun, French, out of Latin, defined as a kind of pipe used by the North American Indians as a symbol of peace. To accept a calumet is to agree to the terms of peace, and to refuse it is to reject them. The calumet of peace is used to seal and ratify contracts or alliances. Calumet baking powder, however, is double acting. This was always a double game. A devil's bargain. Throughout the main hallways of the hotel where the guest rooms are, the staff wing, and at the major exits, there are kitsch paintings of Native Americans here and there, every once in a while just watching in the background. It's a blatantly stark contrast to the main areas of the hotel, such as the games room, lounge, and lobby, the walls of which are practically crammed with more modern framed black and white photos, so many they're basically another character in the film, overlaid and slapped down on the innate native background. The thing that bugged me was that he was bringing all this up because he loved the GD Hotel so much. The beautiful overlook. The traditional overlook. The bloody sacred overlook. Well, I found a scrapbook in the basement. Somebody had put together all the less savory aspects of Ullman's Cathedral, and it looked to me like a little black mass had been going on after hours. Jack Torrance from The Shining. But this damaging cycle, this deadly recursive loop, isn't just repeated on decimated native populations destroyed and forgotten. This was just the beginning, a foundation. It's a repeating pattern so thoroughly woven into our society, we hardly notice it anymore. In the power structure, in the workplace, in the family and cycles of abuse handed down and perpetuated generation after generation, and within the individual who suppresses his or her own identity in order to kiss ass and climb the social ladder in a desperate act to belong until people don't even know themselves anymore if they ever did in the first place. This is a society that has so much food in the pantry it could eat a different menu every day for a year, and yet it eats its own. A uniquely American story. And this is the environment. 
This is the environment. Where we are taught not to face the uncomfortable past, to accept it. To accept and not react to violence. To make excuses and try to justify it. To ignore it. Or to ignore it altogether. Pretend it never happened. Pretend it never happened and dutifully go about our day. The social norms are set within a certain parameter. A certain boundary. And if you want to get anywhere in this society... Want to get anywhere in this society, you better stay within the lines. You better see only what you're taught to see. And keep your eyes wide shut. And keep your eyes wide shut to everything else. To silence that little voice inside. Picking up on all the warning signs and practically screaming. And practically screaming at us that something ain't right here. See? It's okay. We saw it on the television. Our brains receive and process sense information from our environment in order to build a model of that environment. A map we base our decisions and results and behaviors on in order to continue living and surviving in this place. But the map is not the territory. What happens when things keep getting moved ever so slightly out of the corner of our eyes and behind our backs so that we can never fully grasp where we truly are? And that's the maze we're all trapped in. The maze that exists, but doesn't exist, in the Overlook Hotel.